Okrima Media's Polity Yamtabi Madiba, South African educator, activist, feminist, and community organizer, Joyce Pilisa Soroke, joins me to discuss her book title, Joaha Induna's Daughter. Um, Mom Joyce, your memoir addresses South Africa's contemporary challenges with the economy, leadership, justice, and peace, as well as the role of women in South Africa. Talk to us about the inspiration behind this memoir. Well, I was inspired to write the book after I'd been telling a lot of stories to my friends, to my colleagues at work, to my family. And every time I finish the story, somebody would say, oh, I wish you could write a book because this is a wonderful story which you must share with other people. So that's how I started now because I said, wow, everybody is excited about the stories I'm relating about South Africa, the sadness, the beautiful stories, and the courage of the people, even though we were so deeply oppressed by apartheid. But out of some of those stories, there was courage, and with that courage gave people hope that things will finally change. Mm -hmm. So that is what put me on the track to say, well, my friends are right. Let me share these stories, not only by word of mouth, because I can't manage to speak to everybody, but if I write a book, the younger generation will be able to read about those stories and be inspired by those stories and be encouraged by those stories. And born into privilege as a chief's daughter, what led you to join the struggle for non-racial, just and democratic society? It was not difficult because I, I, I got that from my own. Mm -hmm. My dad, my, the whole family were involved somehow. Even if they were not active in, in, in being members of political parties, but some of them were. And so as I was growing up, I would listen to their stories, their anger and their, their, their determination that this thing cannot be allowed to go on. And so from that age, I was kept it. That's why I start relating that even though I went to boarding school at Hilltown, and there, there was nothing talked about, but about the struggle, about the situation in the country. I had that knowledge from my home, because from the example of my parents, I could see that they were also in, in some way trying to address the situation. My mother, through her involvement in the Zenzele eh, 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 group as early as those many years where they encourage the people that despite all these problems, you must learn to help yourself. That is how that Zenzele grew, that you must do it for yourself. You mustn't give up. Mm -hmm. My dad, through his involvement, in the mind, he was supposed to be the, 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 the personnel officer, but he was merely regarded as Luna. But they didn't realize that for him, that title of King Luna made him realize that who the Indunas of the, of the rural areas, who are wise people, who are there to protect the people around them, who are there to make them uh, uh, aspire. So in this way, even though they called him Induna and in a, in a, in a, 
a bit of hate in Mena, but he proved to them that he was going to also fight for the rights of the miners. So that's how I got to know about the evil system of migrant labor, mm -hmm. how it separated the families after the land was grabbed in 1913. The men were forced to go to the cities and not allowed to bring their families around. So as I was growing up, I mentioned that I just wondered how these people felt when they saw us privileged group who were with our parents, who were nurtured by our parents, and who were belonging to the community, and how they must have felt when we could not reach out to their families in the country. So it was obvious that growing up, I was going to become the activist that I was. And observing, and also because my parents would sit and say, you must not be happy with the things that you have, but you must also worry about what other people don't have, and you must share your knowledge, and mm -hmm. you must share even your, your goods. And you reference meeting former President Nelson Mandela when he was released from jail. Briefly tell us more about the night he was released, where you happened to be a guest at Archbishop De Desmond Tutu's residence in Cape Town. Well, that became one of my favorite stories. Mm -hmm. I would tell it when I was overseas on my meetings, when I was with my friends at home, because for me, that was a wonderful, wonderful happening for me. I didn't know that Mandela was going to be released. Mm -hmm. We were all being happy about the political uh, 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 leaders who were released and, and the political parties that were unbanned. And we were rejoicing about it. And then my daughter, when she was admitted at the University of Cape Town, decided that I must accompany her for registration. And for me, it was just a, a, a no way I could do that because I was now involved in this excitement with the groups. We were meeting, we were planning, you know, PA parties and so on. That she insisted that I go to Cape Town and accompany me. Well, in the story, I say we traveled, we got to Cape Town, but before I went to Cape Town, I shared my story about this girl making me leave because my story group was busy in this excitement. And then Mrs. Pitu just said, oh, Joachim, if you are going with me, because we have to travel so early before the registration, because we are traveling by bus, so go and stay at Bishop Court. Even if I am here, I will ask my housekeeper to look after you and Misha. So when we arrived, and got to Bishop Titus' place as blind, the housekeeper, lo and behold, said, Hey, look, that Mandela has been released, is going to be released today, and it's going to be a big rally for him at the city hall. So, wow, I got excited. He put everything away and he went to the city hall. Unfortunately, it took too long to come out. And he gave up. And Michelle and I returned 
very disappointed that we were not seen. But the biggest excitement was when we arrived at the church for and the house keeper tells us, hey, 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 put away those bags, come and help me prepare. Adiba is going to sleep here tonight. So you can imagine that shock. Wow! And then the next day I get a call from my friend Mrs. Piki and she said, Draha, I will not be able to join my husband to come and forward my dealers and children. You take over and be the hostess with the You know, that was such a big honor for me. And I couldn't imagine that someone could also be privileged for me. And so, because I was that type of person, I immediately got into the swing of things and we prepared for me. And then I Oh, my mother and say, hey, mama, I'm going to welcome a Daphne Mandela and I just want you to tell me his clear name is easy to go right so that when he arrives, at least I can just mention one or two of them. And so my mother gave me his name. We dress up after preparing the excitement. The other thing that one of the most exciting things was that my daughter and I were asked to prepare the bed where my daughter was going to see that night. Mm -hmm. So that was another exciting for us. So when we finally changed after cooking and helping, the housekeeper. Mm -hmm. I go down the stairs so when we come in we see my dear. And true to form, I recited the plain name. Madiba, William, and so on and so on. And mm -hmm. I think and I said, wow, no one can believe that I was here to welcome you. And so that was my favorite. Mm -hmm. And can you talk to us about your days serving in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and how did it feel establishing support structures within communities for victims of gross human rights violations? That was another exciting venture for me. I will call it exciting in the sense that we, all of us who are now invited to serve in those communities we felt it was a privilege for us to be expected to be part of this beautiful process of transforming our country from the ruthless past of the apartheid and mm -hmm. and to a new era of human rights where it's going to be non-racialism, non-sexism, equality, so it, it, it was an exciting venture and really indeed and it was a great privilege, not only for me, but for all of us. We had to start from scratch, going to NGOs to talk about the truth commission and putting up the, the structures that we needed, how the victims and survivors would be invited to come and share their stories. And it was easy for me because most of those NGOs I had worked with when I was still with the young woman, Christian Association. 
It's about encountering your children and it's new adults. So it, it, it was as new to old bodies who had been activists before. And it was an exciting way of learning. And of course, it was also not easy because some people did not believe in it. They were saying it was not the right thing that happened because what should have happened to the just in these people in France and sent to Jesus. Whereas there was this clause in the text that said people must be encouraged to tell their stories so that people to know about how they suffer and then the perpetrators will come forward to say please forgive us and if the victims wanted to or were satisfied they would say yes so it, it, it was not an easy where today many people were excited about being part of this process and those who still believed it was not a good process, <laughs> especially the granting of amnesty to the population. That mm -hmm. was a sore for many people. And of course, even for us working there, you, you were ambiguous about the whole thing. Once you want to encourage uh, uh, this process, then you also feel very bad about people getting away with murder and they are released afterwards just because they ask for for forgiveness. And then another problem was even when they did ask for forgiveness, you were not sure how genuine you were or we just said it because they wanted to to be excused from everything from responsibility and from going to jail and so on. A lot of inspiration for contributing to the struggle for gender equality in South Africa was drawn from your mom. Can you tell us how her teachings molded you into the woman you are today? My mother taught me that even if you are a girl, you need to be educated because through education that's where you get the knowledge and the information. So you remember that time girls were not sent to school, but my mother did not socialize us that way. So that's how she started. And then I saw her doing projects for young women in the Y in the in the wide and she in the way she started and empowering those girls to be on their own and to have self-esteem and to be who they want to be. So I got that from my mom and then in the process of growing up, I also got examples from other women like the Charlotte McCarthy and the women who were in the, 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 the women's life. And then I became a member of the YMCA, and that's where I carried out this empowering of women so that they must have confidence that we also deserve the same opportunity as the men. And you contributed immensely to combating gender oppression and exploitation. The South African government has announced a private sector-led multi-sectoral gender-based violence and femicide response fund. So do you yes. think the South African government is doing enough for gender-based violence victims? Well, they were not doing enough before because they were not accountable and we didn't see that they were political will. But this is the step in the right direction that they, and they were awakened by the young women who put up that struggle. And if those young women had not done so, the government would still be letting behind. Mm -hmm. 
So we want to stay. Let us wait and see. And it will depend on the people who are in that community as to what influence they will bring to the government to be accountable and to have the political will to fight gender-based violence. But I feel also the fundamental thing is that the government should fight this actual and be bold to stay to traditional leaders and all forms that are still uh, 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 having stereotypes against women and, and uh, against women to say to use the constitution mm -hmm. because the constitution gives us the rights as women and as as as, as members civil society members of this country that we should also aspire to the same ideas and we should be given the same opportunity. That was Joyce Billy Soseroke speaking to Krima Media's Polity about Joaha Induna's daughter.